Hello, everyone, and welcome to OBI's Public Talk on Youth Mental Health. My name is Tom Mickelson. I'm the President and Scientific Director of the Ontario Brain Institute. The OBI is a provincially funded non-for-profit working to accelerate discovery and innovation, benefiting both patients and the economy. Many members of the OBI team, including me, reside on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. So today, this meeting place is still home to many First Nations Inuit and Métis peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Over the past eight years, OBI has hosted more than 25 public talks featuring experts from Ontario's neuroscience and brain health communities, sharing their knowledge on a wide range of topics. The goal of this initiative is, of course, to educate, inform, and empower our guests about the impact of brain disorders, as well as about uh, advances in research. So the brain health topics that uh, you'll see covered in this year's talks were prioritized by you, our viewers and event attendees. For example, you've told us your stories of diagnostic journeys and barriers to care. And we hear that for many, uh, the gaps in the mental health care system uh, may uh, be proliferating. So you've let us know that you'd like to learn about participating in research and how patient data is used. So in response to all this, what we aim to do at this talk and throughout the year is to feature pathways and services that support the one in three Ontario is impacted by a brain disorder. But perhaps most importantly, we'll endeavor to share our stories of people with lived experience. So you've joined us today for Youth Mental Health, co-creating strategies for success, the first of our four talks in our 2022-23 Your Brain Health series. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from young people dealing with mental health issues, as well as from clinicians and community care workers, but how they challenged their space within the healthcare system and reimagine it as a more accommodating place. Our hope is that the knowledge they impart will lay the groundwork uh, for successful strategies for other youth impacted by mental health issues and their loved ones. Since its inception, OBI has united the Ontario neuroscience community by prioritizing this patient experience, as well as that of the, their advocates and caregivers so that better treatments can be developed and delivered. So the OBI team and our collaborators have worked hard to put people first, and we hope that tonight's talk demonstrates our ongoing efforts. So now, without further ado, I'll hand things over to the panel, which will be expertly moderated by Rakib Tesfaye, a science communication lecturer, CBC Radio Science columnist, and a PhD candidate in the Integrated Program of Neuroscience at McGill University. Rakib, thanks for joining us. Over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Rakib Tesfaye. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. I will be your moderator this evening. Welcome to the first OBI public talk as part of Your Brain Health series. As Tom mentioned, today we're going to be discussing youth mental health and co-creating strategies for success. We are glad to have you joining us this evening. Now, we do only have about 45 minutes uh, to discuss with our expert panelists. Uh, it's not a lot of time, so we're going to try to take as many questions as we can um, during the time that we do have. So please send us your questions. You can uh, use the chat function on the right uh, side of your screen. You can also send us a DM on Twitter. Our Twitter account is at Ontario Brain, or you can email us at communications at braininstitute.ca. Now, Let's have our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, we're gonna get started with uh, Nathan, Nathan Tasker. My name is Nathan Tasker. Um, I have been in many different studies uh, with relation to uh, the Ontario Brain Institute and some of its partners, CPNet and CanChild. Um, I've also uh, been lucky enough to uh, complete my master's at the University of Waterloo in public service. I'm a voiceover artist. Um, and I am so thrilled to be here today uh, to help other persons with disabilities, much like myself, who may be questioning why data is absolutely important and why more important than that, lived experience is important. Um, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be here on this panel. Thank you, Nathan. I'm gonna next go to Evdakia. Hello, everybody. I'm Evdeki Anagnostu. I'm a child neurologist by training and a professor at the Department of Pediatrics at University of Toronto. And I lead uh, the, one of the programs funded by the Ontario Brain Institute, 
the province of Ontario Neurodevelopmental Disorders Network. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about the work that our youth have done to communicate um, their mental health to the rest of our communities. My name is Rula Markoulakis. I'm a scientist at Sunnybrook Research Institute and a status assistant professor in occupational science and occupational therapy and rehabilitation sciences at the University of Toronto. I am very passionate about patient engaged research and have conducted research with youth with mental health concerns, um, acting as researchers alongside our research team and really tend to focus on care needs, access to care and transitions in care for youth with mental health and or addictions concerns and their families with a focus on system navigation. Thanks very much for having me today. Thank you, Rula. And last but not least, we're gonna to go to Rudolf. Hello, my name is Rudolf Uher. Nice to see you all here. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and uh, researcher at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I work with youth and adults, and I'm most interested in depression and bipolar disorder, how to help people not to develop them and or get the most effective treatment as early as possible. Thank you so much, Rudolf, and welcome to our panelists. Uh, I'm excited for this discussion. We're going to start off with Nathan. Uh, as, as a child, you mentioned that you participated in research studies, and these were primarily focused on collecting quantitative health and physical data. And it was only later during your college, year, your college years as a young adult that you were invited to share your lived experience as a person living with cerebral palsy. And so, and this was for the My Story Project. Can you tell us yes. a bit more about can you tell us a bit more about this project and your experience <laughs> participating with it? And, you know, and, and to follow up on that, it, why you believe integrating this type of qualitative lived experience is an important piece to youth mental health. Absolutely, I can. Um, so the first thing I would like to say about the My Story Project is it was seven years ago. It is still being talked about today. That speaks to the impact of it. Um, but it studied uh, physical health, uh, fatigue and pain, mental health, uh, anxiety and depression, chronic stress and overall well-being in adolescents and young adults with cerebral palsy between the ages of 16 to 30. And I found it groundbreaking at the time because, uh, as Rakib had mentioned, I spent a lot of uh, my formative years um, being essentially stretched out. I can remember going out and uh, meeting with an occupational therapist and meeting with uh, researchers uh, from the Ontario Brain Institute, from, but especially from uh, CanChild. And uh, what they would do as a young child would be to pull on my legs, uh, see how well I could stretch, how well I could flex, uh, and uh, get me to do some uh, ordinal level things like, can you walk? Can you bounce on a balance beam? Those sorts of things I remember from my childhood. And as Rakib alluded to, the My Story Project allowed me um, to really flex my muscles as a person. And um, that is uh, the fundamental crux of the study. What it was, uh, at least for my involvement of it, was uh, I got together uh, telecommunica uh, telecommunication wise, you'd think I'd be able to say that, but no. Um, and uh, I was able to uh, basically just talk about life with other like-minded individuals. Uh, our names got um, completely uh, switched around for confidentiality purposes. Our stories were shared and it was a groundbreaking research study uh, by CPNet and I thank them wholeheartedly for it. The reason I thank them wholeheartedly for it um, is because when you look at studies uh, just from the perspective of youth and from the perspective of loving parents, um, people with sorts of disabilities, they're basically looking for a couple of things, at least from a personal perspective. What it, is this going to do for me in reading this? I could read through facts and figures and all this other stuff, but what does this mean for me as a person? And there's so much wealth 
in a person's knowledge and a person's lived experience. And the My Story Project really allowed you to do that. The thing I hated most, and I still dislike to this day, is going into a doctor's office and uh, going into a study, any sort of thing like that, and being seen as a number. I don't want to be seen as a number. I want to be seen as a human being. Uh, and uh, that, to me, is the fundamental crux of what the My Story Project was able to do. Down the line, people with disabilities are going to be looking for answers for their lives. Uh, whether it be you be 16, 17, and you're looking to transition out of healthcare, or you're looking to further yourself um, beyond that, what's it going to be? You can talk about facts and figures all you want, but if you have that lived experience there, there's a calming effect that will greatly help individuals with disabilities in the future. And I cannot thank uh, the My Story Project enough for that. Mm, thank you so much, Nathan, for that. And, you know, to carry on with what you had said that we're, you know, we're more than just numbers. Um, Evdokia, you know, much of youth mental health has relied on quantitative data, right? Has relied on that on that data and, and, and assigning these numbers. So as a clinician and a research scientist, can you tell us from your perspective, why this qualitative experience for youth, from youth rather, is vital and, and how the Child Bright video project that you've helped spearhead highlights this importance. Yes, so, so I mean, numbers are important. I don't wanna say that numbers are not important because they allow us to look at relationships. We can start looking at relationships between mental health, strengths and weaknesses, difficulties and triumphs and how they relate to brain and genomics and other types of exposures we can quantify. But they don't tell the whole story and they don't tell the story the way the youth want to say it. So the, the idea between, behind Ch the Child Bride Project is that the, the youth council of the Pond Network was funded by OBI wanted to do their own project to tell clinicians about their mental health in their own words. And so they applied with us and with Dr. Jana Lansky from CAMH and Dr. Patrick Zakira from Durham University now in, um, in the UK as co-investigators to develop a project that would tell their stories with their own words about their own mental health. A couple of things that come up often in these types of projects and why they're particularly valuable is that they don't tell us only about the things that we ask them. So in the quantitative studies, we ask a question, they respond, right? We get good data, we may get data that's consistently collected by everybody, but we don't get the data for the things we didn't ask them. These youth told us stories that went beyond what we thought was important. For example, that, that their mental health care happens in all kinds of sectors in our healthcare system and outside of our healthcare system. And if we were to address their mental health needs, we cannot be just thinking about mental health system, for example. And you're gonna hear some, uh, one of at least of these stories from one of our uh, youth, but the, the richness of the information in their own voices and their own priorities, not just answers to our, our questions that we set out to them. Yeah, thank you for highlighting, highlighting that up to Kia. It's, it's that, you know, you don't want them, you don't want these two separate, you know, data and qualitative pieces, uh, separate entities, but rather alongside one another, informing one another. Um, and so, as you mentioned, we're, we're going to hear from one of the Child Bright video project participants, Noah Barnett. Uh, Noah is a York University a uh, student at the Schulich School of Business there, and he produced a video about his lived experience with OCD uh, that he has kindly agreed to share with all of us tonight. So we also caught up with Noah before the event. You're gonna hear a few words from him about his experience participating with Child Bright as well. So thank you, Noah. <laughs> It all started when I was washing away the dirt 
and a place that was so familiar. But this time, this one time, I couldn't stop scrubbing because I couldn't see myself come clean. Kept clawing away. Couldn't find the answers. Troubleshooting. Stuck. Waiting for the browser to load. How do I get past this thought? Am I going to live? What happens when I die? God, I'm going to die, aren't I? What happens then? Nothing I told myself seemed to work. And I couldn't leave until I got through to the other side. No matter what skill I learned, self-taught or not, it failed. Over and over and over. Thank God for the relationships I managed to build with others. My mom, dad, and my helpers from the clinical world had more skills than I and took over going into overdrive. From there on in, I was lucky. Other people showed me the way to be able to see the dirt rinse away. I didn't need glasses, I just needed to see it in a different way. I needed to learn more about myself and ask others questions about how, just how, to deal with all this sh and modify it in a way that works best for me. Because not everyone is wired the same, and what works for you might not work for me. I just found my way to the other side, and you can find yours. Just ask all your questions to someone that you can trust to no end. The questions I've asked have given me some of the answers. My parents taught me to be open and communicative because if I don't share what's in my head, it's hard to get another's advice, my answers. Even if they may understand some of it and are going through the exact same things as I am, they may not be able to hear my voice through only my body language. My helpers taught me how to be self-confident in my abilities to fight my battles, thoughts, and how to defy my fears all through visualization. Of course, I am still learning how to get the full scope of knowledge, the full tool belt of skills to use to my advantage. But this is only the start. And I can already see that I'm not dirty, I'm beautifully clean. I was diagnosed with OCD when I was about 14, but I've kind of been experiencing it all of my life because my, my father has it, my, more, probably both of my siblings have it. So it's kind of been always there. And it's luckily for me, it wasn't stigmatized. So we always talked about it growing up. So it didn't affect me like as much as I could have just because we were so open and talking about it. It, it really begins with my involvement in Pond, um, which started when I was about 16. We went to this like family day event that Pond was running. Um, and so I saw other youth up there and was like, I want to do that too. I, I started this uh, youth organization at Pond where it's, it's youth giving advice to doctors as opposed to uh, other physicians giving advice to other physicians and parents. But um, one, at one of our meetings, we were starting to discuss like the youth um, side of it a lot more in the parental meetings, just because of my initiative. And so eventually we formulated that study, the Knowledge uh, Translation Project with Childbright. Um, and it took a little while to get it going. But <laughs> um, that's basically how I got involved in it was just through me being a youth who was advocating to adults. I would say that it's helped me in life generally being involved in the project. It's opened me up to so many different perspectives and it's helped me think through things in a different way that I wouldn't have before. And it's kind of made me realize how, how detailed life is in a way. 
like there's so many intricate steps to things and you have to pay attention to all of them. Otherwise you'll fall through the pitfalls of whatever it is you're doing. And then it's important to pay attention to them because you'll, you'll get more out of what you're doing. Sometimes people treat people who are maybe on the spectrum or other, other diagnoses as like, kind of like, no, they can't communicate in the same way because they clearly can. And I've had experience where they can. And it's, it's important to not diminish their worth. It's important to listen to them just as much as you would to anyone else. That kind of stuff. Well, thank you so much, Noah, for sharing your experience and your video. Um, it was really wonderful to hear your perspective. We're now gonna to turn to Rudolph. And you know, in, in both research and practice, you want to be able to sustain this continuity of care and engagement. Um, but for many youth, they often don't feel like they have agency over their care. Uh, there tends to be an emphasis on the caregivers as primary stakeholders. And as we've discussed before, sometimes you feel that they simply need to just endure and get on with these interventions, right? Um, so can you expand on why this is problematic and how you've approached this problem in your own practice? Yes, thank, thank you for a great question. So in the, in the TIDE project, we, we work with youth who may be experiencing their first depression for the first time in their life. It's a very puzzling experience. And they may be anywhere between 12 year olds to 24 year olds, but the 15 or 16 year old is a fairly typical uh, client for us. And uh, that's, uh, that's the age uh, you are in the middle of adolescence and the adolescence is about stopping doing what your parents tell you and making your own decision and whenever something is your own choice you know it's so, so much more wonderful and you put so much more energy into it than when it's something that a parent thought it's it's good for you and you should be doing so you know we we often meet with a youth and a parent and then the, the parent wants the best for the young person and uh, and uh, it may be quite difficult for them to uh, to accept that the best thing they can do for them is actually letting go a bit and um, and give them give them some space and privacy. So the the, the initial encounter it often starts with a, a bit awkward negotiation kind of. Uh, yes, would it be okay for us to have a, a, a separate conversation with your daughter or son? And um, then if that goes well, it's quite interesting to see the, 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 the fickle, whimsical adolescent turn into a responsible young person who, you know, takes on their, their, their fate and, and is very willing to listen and make decisions, even hard decisions. And uh, when, when we succeed in that, we have we see much better outcomes in terms of the young people engaging with the treatment because it's something they decided for themselves and they they see it as their own responsibility so it's, it's much more likely to happen and to, to help and um, you know that that's why we need youth youth uh, health approach that's that's why the kind of child uh, medical model the pediatric model sometimes it's it's, it's not uh, the best way forward for the special life teams. Mm, thank you so much. And that, you know, kind of mirrors what Noah had said previously, this idea of we can also give advice, not only for our own care, but to the clinicians themselves, right? Uh, so yeah, thank you very much there, Rudolph. Uh, and I, I'm going to turn to, to Rula now. We haven't heard from yet, but you know, as someone who works to navigate youth and families through systems that can be confusing and fragmented, um, what have you seen that that works? What are some of those 
facilitators that are linked to better experiences for youth along their mental health journey. I'm definitely happy to speak to that. Thank you for that question. There's often so much talk about barriers and as important as those are to solve, it goes hand in hand with identifying and enhancing facilitators in the system. And most importantly, what I'd like to share actually comes from research where we heard directly from youth families and providers through qualitative interviews and focus groups. So something we've heard loud and clear is that first off, having care options that are appropriate and comprehensive is important. So appropriate meaning that youth are matched to services that have the right expertise and specialization for them. And comprehensive meaning that services take into account the youth as a whole person and everything they might have going on in the individual facets and contexts of their lives. This also often comes down to not only the skill of the provider and their training, but also their approach. Are they youth friendly? Do they care about building an authentic relationship with the youth? That really matters. Next is, especially we hear this in navigation, making sure that those pathways to care are clear. So often people don't know where to start or where to turn to next, and that delays access to care. But having someone point them in the right direction is crucial and can really set things in motion for the youth. Beyond that, making sure that care is continuous and seamless without interruptions or delays, even when transitioning between services is important. So starting those conversations about upcoming transitions as early as possible, along with warm handoffs between services. Having someone that can be the youth's anchor or touch point in the system is also an important way to provide that continuity that so many youth are unfortunately without. Providing youth with information about their care and their service options is also important and making it relatable and appealing is a bonus. And having some kind of guidance and understanding these options and what might be right for them is crucial because it means that youth can have truly informed choice in their care. Services need to think about equity, diversity, inclusion and belonging too. They need to ensure that they're accessible to the populations that they're trying to reach, taking into account those social determinants of health. And also important in ensuring diversity, sorry, also important is ensuring diversity and representation among their own staff and in their programming, since youth want to see themselves reflected in their services to feel better connected and more comfortable. And considering and creating space for family involvement, we definitely heard, of course, because we spoke with youth and families. And that family involvement needs to be considered if and when appropriate. And that can be an important facilitator in the youth's care. Families are important sources of information about the youth's needs and also important sources of support for the youth. We heard that in Noah's video too, that family can normalize mental health and mental health care. And they can also be available in a practical sense, driving youth to appointments and being available that way. This all of course needs to be balanced with fostering the youth's independence along with consideration of the family dynamic. And finally, of course, system navigation support has been identified as critically important in helping to integrate the system and help youth and families find access and transition through the care they need. I've barely scraped the surface, but so those are some of the key facilitators we've seen across some of our studies of the Family Navigation Project. Thank you so much. And I know there's you know, much more that we can tap into here. So you've done a really wonderful job synthesizing that evidence-based information. Um, and so, you know, something that really you've touched on and, and uh, you know, I'm gonna turn to an audience question uh, now. So again, just a reminder that you can send us your questions, you can direct message your questions to at Ontario Brain or send an email to communications at braininstitute.ca. Um, but as I was mentioning, going back to that idea of incorporating youth and their experience um, as a key factor in the success uh, of, of, of their outcomes during interventions or during their mental health journey, um, you know, how, how can we think about, uh, it, you know, it's not, it might not be common practice. So one of the questions that we have here is, how might youth have more to say in the diagnosis and treatment or have clinicians think about their unique experiences rather than fitting them into a diagnosis into diagnostic categories and standardized treatment plans. So I'm going to throw this one to, uh, shall we say, Rudolph first? Uh, 
I think you can take it in, in many different ways and to be, we can be more or less iconoclastic in this to, uh, to, to, to take, take uh, the, the young person's own view seriously. Um, uh, typically, we, we are in the role of an expert as professional, but the young person is the driver, the, the one who makes the decision. So the, the typical approach is I, I give information. I say, this is what I think is uh, a problem. This is what I think could help. And um, if I can, I give multiple options, multiple possibilities where they can go. I also give advice when I feel it's, uh, it is indicated. But uh, it, it has to be the young person's dis own decision because if, if I tell them something, I, I turn into that parent role of someone who, you know, it's a sport to, to disobey, to not, not do what, uh, what the, the, the physician suggests. So, so that, that's the way we, we typically play it. The, the one golden rule I would say when assessing is uh, first listen, then ask additional questions and then play it back. Then I say, look, from what you told me, I think this is the main problem. And this, I believe, may, may be something we would we'd like to change it this way. Does this sound right? Also asking, did we actually talk about what bothers you the most? Sometimes, um, sometimes the uh, you know the initial phase of the interview. It's hard to be to be relaxed to the way that that I, I actually say what what matters to me the most. So so that's that, that's the rules. Um, I uh, I had the, the privilege to work with Michael Rutter, who who was a child psychiatrist who never tra trained as, as a child psychiatrist and. Uh, and uh, he always said, that when in doubt, take take the child as an adult. Listen, listen to them, and and take them seriously. And, and that tends to work. So, thanks. Mm, thank you. And that and, and that and that kind of fits with what you had mentioned earlier, with this idea of being very intentional about making sure the youth know that they have agency. So whether that's kind of separating them from. Their, their caregivers to do an interview and, and to ask them these questions. Um, it's, it's very, from what I'm hearing, very key to be very intentional with that at the very beginning. Um, do any of the other panelists want to, to chime in here? Yes, Nathan. Um, first of all, I want to uh, say for the record, Bruno knows exactly what he's talking about. Um, I can tell you, um, just based off of lived experience, I, I have no idea of the uh, level of study that all of my esteemed colleagues have. It's far more than mine on this issue. But uh, the clinicians that I found got the furthest with me were the ones who would engage me uh, primarily as a human being. I want to give a shout out to uh, my back uh, specialist, Dr. Keith Sequera, for this, because one of the first things he would do, um, in addition to following the method that Rudolf has laid out, uh, is he would um, interact with me as a person. I remember once he came in and he was so excited. He's like, I've been waiting to talk to you all day. Uh, I've seen this show and there's this guy there called Nate the Great and he's an absolute crazy nut job. Uh, he runs a soccer team and he was talking to me about Ted Lasso and he said, if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It is your humor entirely and you're going to get a kick out of it. Now, um, let's talk about uh, where you think you are in terms of um, your pain levels and other items like that. And I can tell you flat out, it's uh, honestly some of the best care I ever had because you're engaging me as a person and you're engaging my worldview and thus allowing me to further drive the treatment and be more uh, accepting towards treatment because I'm not being talked down to about it. Mm. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, Dakia, you, you wanted to add something as well? 
I was going to add just a couple little things uh, that have been mentioned, but from the experience of the youth, from the many stories that they've told. Uh, so the one thing we've heard from them is validating their experience as real and important is a thing that they missed from our sector, but we don't do it well as clinicians, that they haven't experienced this in our system, that they have to convince us to take them seriously. So validating the experience of youth as a real and important experience seems to be a almost universal ask among the youth. Um, and we need to think as clinicians, again, across sectors, not just in the mental health sector, about how we validate these experiences and, and listen properly. The second thing is that there is, the question was about specific diagnosis and it's a very good one, right? Like the ultimate goal is a good life, right? And how we define a good life is often a very personal thing. So we use the diagnostic categories just to orient ourselves on where we think in the brain the difference may be and what may be uh, responsible for causing distress. But in terms of developing, co-developing plans to get to a good life, if we do not take into consideration the personal preferences of the youth in front of us and their definition of a good life, it would be very hard to accomplish such a good life. So although the diagnosis can be somehow useful to just give us general idea about where it is that we are um, need to focus on or work on, ultimately the, the approach has to be uh, focused on the youth's definition of what a desirable outcome is, of what a good life is, of what, where they find meaning, of where they find distress and where they find joy, right? Uh, so getting back to the youth's individual preferences um, and goals and aspirations um, is critical to be able to get them to the place where they get mental health, because we're not talking about the absence of disease only or disorder. We're talking about mental health and wellness, which goes beyond treating a specific mm. condition. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Abdakia. And thank you everyone for answering that question so holistically. Um, I, I wanna carry on that uh, thread here of, of um, engaging the individual and their interests and their preferences. Um, and so I'm going to ask this to both Abdakia and Nathan. And Nathan, I'll start with you. So, you know, you, you've discussed how your engagement with research involved participating in, in voice acting, which you actively expressed being interested in. You are now a voice actor. Uh, and, and Abdakia, with the Child Bright uh, videos, that, that uses art as well. So there's, you know, video production that goes into it uh, that the youth themselves have to, to navigate and, and, and learn how to, to produce uh, produce this art. And, and, and so can you touch on the importance of using other disciplines like art or whatever may interest youth to involve them in mental health spaces and dialogues? Nathan, I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely, I can. Um, so flat out, one of the best things that came out of my uh, time in the uh, My Story project was that um, one, of the, um, one of the conductors of the study um, called me up about uh, three weeks after um, we had completed our interviews and she said, uh, you uh, said you'd like to do voiceover in your spare time. Um, is that still the case? And I said, absolutely it is. Um, one thing led to another and she said, well, listen, uh, uh, we have a video project. It's with CPNet and uh, we need a voiceover artist Abo above all else. Um, could you maybe submit a demo reel? And of course, um, you're basically telling me, hey, I'm going to give you a shot to get your dream job. <laughs> so, um, of course, um, light bulb goes off um submit the demo and uh i got hired obviously and uh continue to do uh stuff with uh cp net can child ontario brain institute to this day in that capacity you've heard me in the discovery starts with you video but uh further to the question itself um it's again i believe abdiki has hit the nail right on the head with this um it's about 
engaging the youth, engaging the person holistically and looking at that holistically. What do they like to do? What do they not like to do? Um, and figuring that into a way that's going to give them the best quality of life possible. Because at the end of the day, regardless of um, how you feel, um, we as humans, disability or not, take that completely out the, uh, and throw it completely out the window. Disability um, and uh, humanity I would argue, are about finding the best quality of life possible. And if you can engage youth and engage people through arts, through other disciplines, and uh, through other mediums whatsoever, you're going to be able to get a much better experience out of it because as it, it shows that you are actively listening, that you are allowing uh, the youth in question to demonstrate agency, I can tell you... Uh, from my experience as a camp counselor, I had one camper, this is eight years ago, um, whom I absolutely loved to death. Uh, he had uh, intellectual disability. And um, the big thing that he had, the big thing that he would always do is he would have this wonderful little doll. It's called Cranky. You basically, the one taboo was never, ever, ever take Cranky away. Cranky was his comfort. Cranky um, was in many ways an extension of himself, unless you were me, because you could engage Cranky, or I could engage Cranky in such a way where I could make him talk. And that made this kid laugh so much and relate to me on such uh, a much more personal level because I was able to take something from his environment and use my disciplines, what I was trained in, in order to make his life better, his camp experience better. Um, and uh, you will find doing something as simple as throwing your foot up or involving youth in um, um, videos or other disciplines, even sitting down and discussing like what's your favorite TV show, what's your favorite movie, stuff like that is going to have them relate to you a lot more on a personal level because it's about humanity more so than anything else. Mm, thank you, Nathan. And um, Takiya, the same question to you. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, arts is a medium that allows us to do two things. One, it allows the people who are telling their stories to tell us their stories in any form they see fit. So if they can tell large narratives of complicated stories, they can find other ways of telling us stories. But the other thing about art is that everybody else who's listening can listen in different ways, right? So we can tell the stories better and we can hear the stories better through uh, art media. And that's why we have, uh, we, we find a lot of value in engaging artists and artist communities in telling the stories of the youth um, related to their mental health. And in fact, I should say just quickly that these digital stories, you saw one from Noah, but there is several of those, will be shown in arts festivals and art um, exhibits uh, around Canada in the next couple of years. So you may actually see them as purely arts program, uh, arts programming and arts um, products, pieces of art. That's wonderful. And I'm sure that uh, OBI will let everyone know when that happens, and we look forward to, to seeing all those videos. Um, we're now gonna take a few questions from the audience. Uh, Rula, I'll direct this one to you. So one of the audience members asks, COVID helped create more awareness and acceptance about mental health. How can this awareness be used to create change in how we treat youth? Oh. That's a big question. I think so. One thing that immediately comes to mind, and we heard this actually from other qualitative interviews we had done as part of another study, um, we had actually parents cautioning us that with this growing awareness of mental health, that you know, more and more youth are becoming aware of their own mental health needs and mental health concerns, but there was a potential for a negative flip side of this where 
people might begin to just brush off certain behaviors and concerns as being COVID related and that they'll naturally resolve once the pandemic resolves. And we all need to be aware that that isn't necessarily the case, that, you know, some of these effects will be long lasting and particularly for youth, there have been significant impacts during a very important developmental stage in their lives. And it's important for us to be aware that services will need to be in place in the short and the longer term to be able to respond to these changing and evolving mental health needs as a result of the pandemic. So I think we really need to latch on to this momentum that's been gained in mental health awareness and advocate for accessibility of services and um, ultimately awareness for people to be able to find and access the care that they need. Mm, thank you. That's a very, very interesting point. The idea of becoming habituated to it in, so, in, in some respect. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the next question I'm going to direct to Rudolph. Uh, so this audience member asks, what strategies, uh, what are the strategies that youth can use if their parents won't give them the privacy that you noted that they should and could have? So how do you, how do you navigate that tense and awkward situation? Look, it's, it's really, it's really a big question. Uh, we, we, usually my, my, my go to is we, we try to get an adult on board, right? It's it's very hard for a young person uh, of uh, less than age 18 to, uh, to to be fully independent in their life. Our, our society is not designed for that. So they, they need an adult on board. And sometimes it's a parent, sometimes it's another parent, but uh, at other times it's someone, someone at school or, or a it can be a neighbor, etc. So that's that's one thing that that helps. Uh, privacy is so important. We, uh, we we had a lot of move for like you know delivering health uh, healthcare remotely through smart devices through the internet. Our youth, young people, actually express even stronger preference for in person work than uh, than their parents and adults. And, and privacy is the, the number one reason often the, the, the internet connected space doesn't overlap with, with private space for them. So we be also trying to put in infrastructure to enable that. We in Nova Scotia, we work with young people across the province and sometimes we, we go and see them. Tomorrow I'll be driving a couple of hours to see someone, a 16 year old in a remote part of the province. But um, we we also trying to create safe, connected spaces so that the young, the young people can go somewhere where they, they know it's private and where they can go themselves because it's near to where they live. So you know all of that together, enabling uh, creating opportunities for it rather than you know trying to do things behind the back of someone is usually preferable. Hmm. Thank you, Rudolph. So. One of the audience members had a similar line of thinking to the next question I wanted to ask uh, Rulof, uh, Rula and Rudolph, rather. Um, and so, you know, they they touch on that today, the Ontario government mentioned a $3 billion investment in addictions and mental health, um, you know, which is wonderful news. Um, and so, you know, they're thinking about how can this money be used to make real impact on mental health support for youth? And so what I want to ask you both is that as we look towards the future with this type of funding as well, you know, what is one major change you believe as a community we can work towards? And Rula, we'll start with you. Sure. Also another big and important question. I You're getting all the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> we need a concerted and genuine effort to listen to and embed youth voices at all levels of mental health care. So we've heard a lot about the direct care relationship today. And I wanted to highlight some other pieces too. So first off, of course, this can unfold in many different but related ways. So this does mean hearing youth and giving them autonomy in their direct care relationships, creating spaces that are youth focused and youth friendly and helping them feel comfortable accessing care for themselves like Rudolph was speaking about, giving them the information and guidance they need to make informed care choices for themselves. But I 
think also important is that this also means involving youth in an authentic way at the organizational level and having opportunities for their voices to be heard at the systemic level. So seeking feedback from youth and mean, meaningfully using it to invoke change, creating opportunities for co-design and youth advisory and youth leadership roles so that youth can actually be critical driving forces and services. I really don't think that we can possibly design care relationships, services, and systems that truly meet the needs of youth and lead to good outcomes if we don't hear from and involve youth and their loved ones at each of those levels. Absolutely. Thank you, Rula. Rudolph? Look, I think this is the hardest question so far. It's um, in the, such a history of, uh, of uh, big in, making big, big investments and then be, being very disappointing outcomes um, it's uh, it, it looks like a huge amount of money and yet there's there's also a huge need I think the the, the danger is uh, going off for a simple solution falling for one of the hypes like you know of course we can we can you know everyone can can access something simple that works through the internet and uh, and what what I would say is uh, use the money wisely, pay for what we know works, and measure the outcomes, so that so that you can you can direct it. And in in the specific age range, uh, a listening, actual listening to young people, and not just the, the the kind of proactive young people who come for themselves, but the young people who actually are affected with the more severe types of mental illness it's 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 very key so that the, the resources are are directed in proportion to, to where uh, they are needed mm -hmm. and you know in carrying on that, that that point there rudolph you know there are some youth and families who aren't in a position to advocate for themselves um, as strongly yes. as others or who don't have those resources. And, and one of the questions that an audience member um, has asked is, what are other access or entry points into mental health care systems if youth don't participate or haven't participated in research? Uh, and, how can, and how can low income people access treatment for mental health specialists when the costs can be quite high? So I, I'm going to ask Abdukia to, to tackle this question first. Yeah, I mean, I think that question itself is the state of affairs, right? like a sad, a sad statement on the state of affairs. So but the fact that the audience member would think that the easiest way to get mental health care is to come through a research project is on mm -hmm. its own a pretty sad statement, right? So research should be volunteer work that we all do to to get to to make life better for all of us but it should not be where we go when we're in crisis when we're in trouble when we need uh clinical care support so i appreciate the question for what it is um i would say that there are huge huge gaps in and and i think rula referenced this early on um in access to mental health supports for people who carry certain identities or belong to certain groups. So the question referenced the money, which is a very important one in terms of how we bill and how we reimburse mental health care. There is differences from province to province. I'm gonna be not very concrete, but I know the Ontario example in terms of where people can actually get publicly funded mental health care, it, it ends up being in, um, mostly hospital-based care, right, in outpatient clinics and a couple of other places, but uh, a lot of our outpatient mental health is actually free for service. Um, the other thing to think about is all the other identities uh, that kind of interact and sometimes uh, make access to mental health services harder. So for me, because I do uh, serve kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities, getting access to standard mental health care for kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities this is always a struggle just because we have developed such a siloed system uh, that does not think strategically like rudolph said like if we have a money investment it's time for strategy it's not time for spending quickly the money in easy solutions but it's time for strategy 
to think about who's included, who's excluded, what are the bar barriers mm -hmm. for the excluded, and what are the priorities? What are the goals for the excluded? What is it that they want to see in their mental health care system? So I don't have a good answer to her question or his question, except to say, I totally acknowledge the state of affairs um, in, in the mental health care system. I think uh, recent announcements for financial investments are opportunities for strategic thinking to think about mm -hmm. equitable access. And when we think about equity, let's think about all the different barriers that actually um, make it hard for kids and youth to access mental health, whether it's race, money, um, gender identities, Absolutely. all the things that we know become an issue. Absolutely. Thank you, Rev. Dakia. And with that, I mean, we're almost at the end here. As I mentioned at the beginning, 45 minutes goes very quickly. So I want to leave the last word with our wonderful expert panelists. Um, if you can briefly tell the audience what you want them to take away, what's a salient key message you want them to take away from, from this chat today? Uh, Nathan, let's start with you. Uh, with relation to youth as it is, uh, discovery starts with you. Um, don't be afraid to figure out who you are as a person and how your disabilities, your mental health affects that. You are a human. Uh, you are a wonderful, um, you are a wonderful, um, fantastic uh, way of life. Um, and how do you want to live your life? Hmm. Thank you, Nathan. Rula? Sure. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk about difficulties accessing care, and it can make things seem quite negative or make it seem like there just aren't services or resources out there. And I do want to emphasize that we live where there's a terrific system with terrific resources and amazing people doing great work. So chances are there is something out there for you if you need it. It's a matter of finding it, which can be the hard part. So do learn about what's out there, advocate for yourself, and um, we'll, with every hope, get connected to what you need. Thank you, Rula. Rudolph. Turn to you. Thank you. Well, for young people, what I would choose is time matters. Whether someone gets better within weeks rather than waiting months can make the difference. Whether someone finishes education with their peers and moves on with their life as, as planned and reaches their potential. So at, at this age, more than any other age, don't get distracted, don't go for simple solutions, hypes, or principles, take what works and make it, make it available to young people quickly and um, give, them the, give them the choice. Excellent, thank you. And last but not least, Abdakia. <laughs> So uh, I would say to the youth that your experience is important and it's valid and it matters. And if we're not listening, it's not your problem, it's our problem. Call us to it, yell at us, tell us that we are not listening. And for the rest of us, I would say, for the rest of us, I would say we all do mental health. And that came very clear through the digital stories of the youth. We all do mental health. We all are responsible for protecting the mental health of our youth. So even within our sectors of health and social services and education, we don't pass the back to each other. We are all responsible for assuring and protecting the mental health of the youth that come to us. And wonderful, wonderful final note to leave on. Thank you, Abdikia. So on behalf of the Ontario Brain Institute, I want to thank our panelists, Evdakia, Nathan, Rula, Rudolph, um, for just you know being wonderful experts and, and, and having this wonderful stimulating conversation, which I hope um, has, has, has benefited folks tuning in today. Uh, we have some resources to share with you. 
for more information around this topic. Uh, we're going to be posting them on the screen shortly, and, and the complete list is also going to be available on the OBI, uh, the Ontario Brain Institute website. Uh, and your feedback is valuable to us. We have a survey link in the chat box. Uh, so please share your thoughts with us about tonight's talk. Um, OBI public talks are designed to share the latest knowledge on brain health and to offer simple tips to manage both health and wellness. Um, and OBI's current set of public talks is called Your Brain Health. And this series explores topics suggested by you, our audience, via these feedback surveys. So they're incredibly important to us um, for tailoring this content. Uh, so stay tuned for talks on dimensions of care that will be coming up, women's brain health and precision medicine, all part of the, the series, Your Brain Health. So to sign up for the next talk in September, you can find the link in the chat, in the chat box um, or on our website as well. So I want to thank you all for spending time with us this evening. Uh, and we look forward to carrying this conversation outside of this virtual world as well. <laughs>